is writing to a group of Christians that at the time he writes the letter, the president of their country was a guy named Nero. I don't know if you studied Nero very much. I had to do a little reading about Nero myself. Um, this isn't about 62 to 64 A.D., 64 years after Jesus was born that Peter writes this letter. Um, Nero, Nero, here's the kind of guy Nero was. Nero five times attempted to kill his mom. Now, I know at some point in your time you maybe thought, but he really tried. He really tried. One time he uh, tried, he drilled a hole in the bottom of her boat and tried to sink her boat out in the water, but she swam back to shore. Five attempts didn't work, so finally he got some assassins. He hired assassins, and they clubbed and stabbed his mother to death. And Nero uh, watched the city of Rome burn for six days, and then after the end of the fire, he blamed it on the followers of the way, because they weren't called Christians then. They were called followers of the way, but it would have been Christians. Uh, the same Colosseum that you can go, and some in this room have probably seen that Colosseum in Rome. Uh, Nero in that Colosseum would bring Christians in there to either be slaughtered by the gladiators or eaten alive by wild animals. Nero would uh, entertain guests in his garden in the evening time, and to illuminate his garden for his guests, he would burn Christians alive at the stake and use them as lighting in his garden. That was the president. That was the president when he writes this letter. And I know how it is in the day and age we live in. You're, you're pretty sure, you're pretty sure, you're pretty sure that if Jesus was here today, he would be a Democrat because you're a Democrat. You're pretty sure that if Jesus was here today that uh, he would be a Republican because uh, you're a Republican. Or you're a liberal, or you're uh, independent, or you're a whatever, libertarian. And you're pretty sure Jesus would see things your way, and if we just get the right person in leadership, if we just have the right amount of money, if we have the right political arena, if we have the right socialistic uh, government around us, if we just have everything going right and we have the right leader order over all of it, everything will go all right. <laughs> Peter writes to an audience that would disagree with you. Let's read what Peter says. Look what he says in verse number three of chapter one. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I'll point you to two things in that one verse alone. Two things in the one verse. Number one, he points to mercy. He's writing to a church that experienced no mercy. They had no mercy. They were being dragged off and persecuted by the Roman government. They didn't know what mercy was. To show and express mercy in that environment was showing that you were a weak person because in that climate, in that culture, in that environment, might made right. They didn't know what mercy was. And then uh, Peter pulls it back to encouragement at the same place we left off last week. The one thing that unifies all believers around the world, no matter what your doctrine is, the reason that you're here this Sunday morning is because of the resurrection. The resurrection. Because Jesus was raised again from the dead, we have hope of a resurrection. There's something better to come. Verse number four, he says, right now, right now, in fact, you're going to find as we read on, Peter talks about now and the future. He's going to talk about the present and the future. He's going to talk about today and he's going to talk about tomorrow. And in the midst of all of that, he's going to talk about your relationship with God. He and he's going to call it faith. He says, now, now we live with great expectation. We live with great, and the reason we have expectation is because we don't have it yet. We live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. Now, I know the pushback from that verse. When it comes to inheritance, you want to know what you're going to inherit. And when we talk about heaven, it's hard for you to hang on to that because you've never been there. Nobody can tell you what's there, what's waiting for you, what life is going to be like. We want to know what we're inheriting right now. You want to know what you're going to inherit from your parents. Let me just tell you, I know what you're going to inherit from your parents. Nothing, because they don't have anything either. How's that? All right, but I know that when I get to heaven, there's something better to inherit. And nobody's going to change it. Nobody can snatch it away from me. It's there waiting for me. And he's writing, listen, Peter's writing to a group of people that had nothing there was no hope of inheritance because their parents had nothing. You were either a slave, a free slave, or a freed slave. You didn't inherit anything. You died, and it was done, and it was over with. So Peter encourages him with that. And he encourages him with a hope of a future to come. That a guy named Paul said, you know what, let me tell you about, about heaven a little bit. Let me tell you about your inheritance. He said, uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 
If we could sit down and imagine what heaven was like, we would try to recreate it here on earth. Paul says, you can't. You've never seen what's in heaven. There's nothing on earth that compares to it. There's nothing you've heard that compares to what's there. You couldn't even, with all of the people in the world in a big seven billion population think tank, imagine the things that God has prepared for people who love him. That's the inheritance that we get. Verse 5, he goes on. And through your faith, this is that faith. This is that relationship that you have with God. This is the trust you have with God. God is protecting you by, by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed at the last day for all to see. You know what I love about that verse? God is active. He's not retreated. He's not doing something else. He's not busy with something else. He's actively protecting you until the day he comes back. And to the readers of this letter, when they read this, like, well, I didn't protect my uncle. He got snatched away and dragged off by the Roman authorities and put down there for the gladiators to just massacre. But Peter's talking about something more precious, and it's your faith that God wants to protect. You know, I realize as I'm reading this to you and as I studied this, we don't think much about heaven. We don't talk much about heaven because you and I live in such an affluent culture. Why do we want to hope for heaven? We've got all that we want in this life. We've got access to it. We can achieve it. We can save up for it and we can buy it. The other night, the other night, Robin and I laughed at each other. We, we, we've turned into our parents. We're driving around at night looking at houses. We don't plan to buy one. We're just looking at houses, you know? At least I'm looking at houses. She's driving. I mean, we're looking at houses. And we found ourselves in a neighborhood that we'd never been to, uh, at least not for many, many years since years ago when we lived here. <laughs> and I won't tell you what neighborhood it is because you might live in it. And we were driving around the neighborhood looking at the houses, just going, wow. Wow. I mean, wow. Wow. We could never even imagine living. Wow, we're just wowed by these things. And I said to Robin, you know what? This is why we live in such an affluent culture. That little shed in your backyard that stores the snowblower in the summertime and the lawnmower in the wintertime, that is a house in the country of Haiti. We come here and look at the houses. Why do we have to hope for heaven? We drove here in air-conditioned comfort. We're sitting here worshiping in air-conditioned comfort. We're going to go home in air-conditioned comfort. We don't think about heaven. We're such an affluent culture. But the people that Peter wrote to had nothing. Nothing. All they had was hope. Even in our own culture in the United States of America, the African Americans brought here as slaves, their songs were about freedom and salvation in heaven because that's all they had. Peter goes on in verse 6. So be truly glad. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean be truly glad? I got nothing. No, 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 no. Be truly glad. There's wonderful joy. Right now, maybe not right now, but there's wonderful joy ahead. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. He's saying, look, what you see isn't what will be. What you see right now isn't what will be. He's saying there's a greater joy ahead for all of us. And joy, isn't that what all of us in this room want to experience day by day? But we live in the right now, don't we? We live in the right now. We don't always feel or experience that joy. So look what he says in verse 7. These trials, the difficulties that you and I go through, they're going to show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested like fire tests and purifies gold, uh, though your faith is far more precious than gold. Peter tries to draw this parallel. He says, look, 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 people have wars and fights and battles over gold because there's so much value in it. But your faith has more value than all of that gold. And it's this, this battle that goes on for your soul. Now he gives an example of practical faith. You have faith this morning. Here's how you express it in verse number 8. You love him, Jesus, even though you've never seen him. Though you don't see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice in the glorious, inexpressible joy. One day that faith is going to be rewarded. You've never seen Jesus. If you've seen Jesus, come talk to me about it. But you're here this morning because apparently there's some kind of faith or something going on inside of you that brought you to this church today. You're trusting in a Jesus you've never seen, but you've seen the miracles of Jesus. You've seen the power of Jesus, and he's changed your life, and so you're here today. In verse 9, he says the reward for trusting him is going to be the, the salvation of your souls. It's a huge statement right there. I want you to think about your soul for a little bit. 
Your soul is what makes you, you. At the moment of conception in your mother's womb, something started that could never stop. Something began that no man could end. Your appearance in this world might have been through the will of human beings, your parents coming together. But when you were conceived at that moment, you became a soul. And that soul lives forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Tell me when you're sick of me saying it. Ever and ever. This body dies, but your soul goes on forever. And your soul has a destination that you get to choose. You get to choose heaven where you're in the midst of an amazing God that loves you and you find completeness, uh, completeness and all the tears are wiped away, all the mourning is gone. There's absolute celebration and joy and peace and completement and excitement. I mean, it's just, no, I can't even describe because no eye has seen, no ears heard. Or, or you get the choice of going to hell where you're eternally separated from God. You ever heard this one before? Oh, if I go to hell, all my friends are there. They might be, but you'll never know because you're forever separated from them in the bottomless pit where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You, you get the choice. You get the choice. Well, 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 th th that's what's to come. That's what's to come. So what about the right now? Look at verse 13. So you know what you're supposed to do right now? Verse 13, prepare your minds for action. Exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the, in the gracious salvation that's going to come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. When he's saying prepare yourself, he's saying get it together. Come on, people. You're all panicking me about stuff that's going on in the world today. You've watched the news, you've read the headlines, and you're all in disarray and you're all excited and frustrated by the. Come on, get it together. There's something better to come. Put all your hope, not in what you see with your eye on this earth, put your hope in heaven above. But isn't it true, isn't it true that we, you know where we, you know where we put our hope? In our next purchase, in our next achievement, our next acquisition, um, our next job, the next paycheck. Some people put their hope in the next leader. <laughs> Verse 14. You must live as God's obedient children. This is where it gets real for us. He says, look, don't, don't, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. Do you, do you know why Peter says don't slip back? Because he knows when we lose hope, we just quit and give up. When we lose hope, we quit and give up. We could take a, a roll call. We could make a roster of all the people that are watching online today, watching uh, on their TV sets. We could take a, a roster of all the people. Here, write down all of your names that were here on this day in June in 2016. And then let's go back and, and, and revisit that list of names 20 years from now, and let's see how many names would still be on that roster. Unfortunately, some people will just quit and give up and walk away from the faith because they didn't think it was worth it. I'm just telling you, if the journey is too great, the passion is too small, if there's no value in the reward, if there's no value in the reward, there's no value in the journey. <laughs> Do you know why I'm not saving up for a boat? Because it's not worth it. How many are with me, right? Thank you. That's why I'm not saving up for a boat. But if I think something is valuable enough, I will sacrifice to make it happen. Your faith has to be that valuable. Your faith has to be that valuable. Verse 15, he says, look, but, but, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. We don't talk about being holy very much because we don't like that because when God talks about us being holy, he talks about us just being separate from all the other junk of the world. To be holy, generations past in the church meant that your hair was a certain length and you didn't listen to certain music and... Um, that women didn't wear jewelry and make up to church and your skirts had to be a, a certain length. That, that, that was being holy. And I'm telling you, I don't keep the rules to earn God's love. It's because of God's love I keep the rules. If you're married, you understand this. Can you imagine how a marriage would be if it was like this? Honey, you just keep that good food on the table. You keep looking good. Keep my clothes washed and keep the house clean and we'll have a great marriage. How would that marriage go for you guys? If any of that stops, you're out. 
The same could be said from her to you. You know, keep the belly behind the belt, not over the belt. Okay, all right, that kind of thing. She, she can make her list of rules too. Just saying. But God's love is unconditional. But I will serve God unconditionally because I love him. Verse 17. And remember that the Heavenly Father to whom you pray. This is like, this is like Peter. Peter knows how we are in the church. You know how believers are? And I know I'm talking primarily to, to believers today. Well, I'll make it real here in, at the end. You know how it is in the church? We start to compare ourselves. We start to compare our righteousness with other people. <laughs> Peter knows we do that. He says, look, 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 remember the Father to whom you pray? No favorites. How many are disappointed by that, huh? Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. No, no, he's got no favorites. He's going to judge or reward you according to uh, what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary strangers. This isn't home. Remember that. Conduct your lives. Love the future so much that it changes the way you live in the present. Because just because you know how to call on God, you know how to sing the songs, you know how to act when you get to church, look, 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 I'm just telling you, on Judgment Day when all of us stand before God, God doesn't have any favorites there. So you got to start in this life to get ready for the next life. Because once the trumpet sounds, it's too late. We're just temporary residents here anyway. You're going to go on vacation this summer, stay in a hotel room somewhere. You don't go down to Target. Walmart, buy a bunch of decor to put in your hotel room. You just stay in there for a night or two. So don't get too comfortable with life here because this isn't the real life. There's a better one to come. Verse 18. You know, you know that God now, as if, as if Peter, Peter just laid the heaviness on us, and now he's going to put a little bit of guilt there. He says, look, look, look. Here's why you do what you do, because you know that God, he paid a ransom to save you from this empty life that you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with just gold or silver, which loses their value. Verse 19. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. In other words, you know, let me just remind you why you should be obedient to Jesus. Because God, he's speaking to people so familiar with slavery. God ransomed you, but he didn't bring his money bag when he came to ransom you. He brought the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Just remember that your freedom costs something. Just remember that. Verse number 20, God chose Jesus as your ransom long before the world began. It wasn't as if one day Adam and Eve messed up in the garden and God said, oh, I didn't have a contingency plan. Now what am I going to do? He knew the actions and the choices of humanity. Aren't you glad you serve a God that's got a plan in place long before anybody messes it up? God's large and in charge. Well, how do we respond? So we're going to get intensely practical now. Really, really practical. We got theological. Now we're going to get really practical, of bringing it back to what in this world are we supposed to do in light of all the things going on in our culture and bathrooms and leaders and just on and on and all that whole kind of thing. What are we going to do with all that? Chapter 2, verse number 13 says this. Look, the, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, not for Pete's sake, <laughs> for the Lord's sake, when you're watching the news and there's all kinds of laws going on and Supreme Court choices and presidents and governors and principals of your school and bosses at work, for the Lord's sake, would you just submit to all human authority? And then he qualifies it here a little bit. Whether the king is head of state or to his officials that he's appointed, Goes on, verse 14, for the king has sent them, these officials, to punish those who do wrong and honor those who do right. In another place in scripture, a guy, a guy named Paul says, look, all authority is put there by God. And he says, the only people that need to be afraid of the law are the lawbreakers. Come on, come on, how many are driving down the road and you see this car behind you with lights on top? And they're not flashing yet, but you immediately look at the speedometer. <laughs> and there's this little palpitation in your chest. You want to make sure you're obeying But if you're always a law abider, you don't have to worry about that, do you? And since I don't drive, I never worry about it. Okay. Okay. I'll let you worry about it for me. And then, and then verse 15, if you want to know the will of God, we're almost done, almost done. Hang in here with me. 
It's God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. In other words, in other words, you know what? If you think there's hostility towards Christianity today, you should have been there when Peter wrote this letter. Isn't it true that the, uh, the hostility towards Christianity seems to be rising incrementally? That there's laws passed and there's just things going on. We don't understand the half of it in the United States of America. You go to North Korea and you go to Syria and you'll find out what it costs to be a Christian. But he says, in the midst of that kind of a culture or climate, you live in such a way that when people watch you, they go, I don't get it. Why are people so mean to these Christians? I just don't get it. Because look at the way they live. They live the way we ought to be living. Going back into history, one of the things that Nero noticed about followers of the way of Christians was they love each other. My, how they love. Those were his words. My, how they love. So apparently they adhered to Peter's words and they they lived in such a way that it impressed the culture around them. Let's impress our culture. Let's season our culture. We're the generation to do it. We shouldn't cower in fear. I mean, let's just dig a bunker and buy some food and hide. And when Jesus comes back, it'll all be over with. I'm just saying, let's charge out into our culture and let's make the influence and silence the ignorant talk of those who make accusations against us. Now, the last verse I'm going to read, this is where it gets intensely practical and maybe a little uncomfortable because here, here's here's what i know most of the verses in the bible i like and there's some i don't anybody else with me for god so loved the world i love that verse don't you love that verse delight yourself in the lord he'll grant you the desires of your heart i love that verse don't you love that verse i don't like this next verse we're going to read look what it says in verse number 17 Respect everybody. Let's just stop right there. Respect everyone. But pastor, you know what? Do you see, do you see the way they live? Do you see their lifestyle choices? Pastor, he's got tattoos. I know, I know. Do you see what's in his ear? Yeah, I know. Do you see who he's living with? I know. And he's a Democrat. I know. But you know what else he is? He's a creation God made. And he has exactly the same value that you do. Same value. I don't want to respect him because he doesn't believe like I believe or live like I live. I know. I, I know. But um, God didn't put any disclaimers in here. He just respect everybody. And then he says, um, love the family of believers. I could love most of the family believers, but let's just be honest. Some of them are just, they're just prickly. I know. Don't you think you're prickly sometimes? No, 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 no. I mean, I'm kind of the standard of what it is to be loved in the church, you know. He says, fear God. Not this kind of a fear, but the kind of fear that understands that God has your life in the palm of his hand. I mean, the next breath that you draw into your lungs, the next second as I'm speaking, comes there by the grace and the power of God. God's the one that's got it in control. And, and, then, and then he ends with this statement. I, I don't like this statement. Respect the king. But I don't like the king. I don't like the way the elections went. I don't like the people on the ballot. I don't want either of them to be the king. I don't want to respect the king. No, you respect the king. Do you know, do you know why you can respect the king? Because you fear God. And God put the king there. Do you know why Kim Jong-un is in leadership over North Korea? God put him there. Bashir al-Assad, do you know why he's there? God put him there. Vladimir Putin, do you know why he's in charge? Because God put him there. President Barack Obama, do you know why he's there? Because God put him there. God has a plan. God has a plan. God has a plan. So then you can respect the king. 
you respect the office of the king. <laughs> you say, Pastor, but but no, 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 no. And do you know, do you know why? Do you know why we can hold this in our hearts? Because when Peter wrote this this letter and he's telling them to respect the king, do you remember who the king was? Nero. The guy that was burning Christians in the Colosseum. In fact, sometimes he would put Christians out there to the gladiators or to the lions at nighttime. And then he'd take Christians and put them at stakes around the top of the Colosseum and burn them there to illuminate things down at the bottom. And Peter says, respect the king. What, we, what in the world are we, the we going to do? You know what we're going to do? We're going to respect others. This, this is the do for us. You wonder, Pastor, what do you want me to do with what you've shared this morning? I want you to respect others. I want you to love other believers. I want you to fear God. And I want you to respect the king with me. Can you imagine if in the United States of America, for one solitary day, there was mutual respect amongst all people, regardless of race, religion, or creed? Can you imagine that? There would not have been a shooting in a nightclub in Orlando last night. 20 people dead. Can you imagine if for just a month, all the believers in all the churches across the U.S. that proclaim and profess a relationship with Jesus just loved each other for a month. That they, they surrendered their preferences and their personal desires. Do you know why churches divide and split? It's not over doctrine, it's over preference. <laughs> I want my way, and I'm going to get it. What if for a month we just put all of that aside for a little bit? What if, what if, what if for a month... Christians, instead of bashing the king, started praying for the king. Do you think that would make a difference in America today? I think it would. All of that is to say this. It's easier to live without fear of the present when you have a love for the future. It's easier to live without frustration in the present when you have a love for the future. It's easier to live without disdain and anger in the present when you have a love for the future. Because you know what? All of us in this room, we are temporary strangers on planet Earth. We're only just passers through. You're one day going to end up in a cemetery. I'm going to encourage you with this at the very end. And they're going to put a big piece of rock at the top of that grave up there, and they're going to put your date of birth and your date of death. And 150 years from now, not a single solitary soul is going to know you. You're forgotten. And nobody knew you. Nobody had relationship with you. You're just gone. You just passed through this life so quickly. But there's a better, longer, eternal life to come for all of us. And when we start planning for that future, we can live better in this present. And so maybe, maybe, maybe as we close today, we just need to come and just take a moment in prayer and just have an attitude adjustment. Or maybe we need to pray for our leader. Or maybe we need to pray for just life and things that are going on in our marriages, in our homes, whatever's going on. So let's pray.